All right, folks, let's get going on chapter nine. Um, those of you who are marketing majors, you will take an entire class on how to do market research. Um, the whole semester covers how to conduct it, what research is all about, and really di di dives into the topics here. So like I've mentioned before, this is just an overview for you to kind of hit the high points. Um, one thing that I think is interesting, the title of somebody who works at a marketing firm or at a company that does research is often the director or the manager of marketing research. Um, you'll also see a title called vice president of customer insights or consumer insights um, or director of consumer insights. And so if you're applying for jobs and you see things like that and you're reporting to somebody with one of these titles or maybe you even know somebody in the industry with a title, they focus a lot on the research and how they can use information to describe and predict different trends in the market. So in chapter eight, you learned about the, what a market is. And so here we're gonna jump into all the steps to the research process. So let's kind of dive in here. Um, you understand research, you've heard the term at SFA in different contexts. And so marketing research formally in this class is the process of planning, collecting and analyzing data to a market decision. So this may link customer and consumer information this will provide data on the marketing mix. So what is a consumer willing to pay? What does a consumer want? Thinking about price and product. Um, what, how do I reach the consumer through advertising and marketing techniques? That would be promotion. And then how do I um, jump in and say, you, how do I use this data to manage information after I get it? And so one of the things that we'll talk about in a minute is the marketing process. And one of the things to remember is you actually have to be able to evaluate and implement whatever you find in the data. Remember how when we talked about strategic planning, we talked about how you have to have something more, you might do all this beautiful strategic planning, but then you look up and oh, by the way, um, we had a plan that was on the shelf for years and years and years, and we never actually implemented it. Well, that is something that you will see here in marketing research that's also important is that you have to follow through. So when you get marketing information, then you have to step in and actually implement something that is based on that information or else what is the point of doing it? So the role of marketing research can be descriptive. So to tell somebody about their audience or about their product or about the market, diagnostic. So why is something happening the way it's happening? Why are we seeing the trends that we're seeing? and predictive. So, okay, we know what's happening now, but what's going to happen in the future? So the role of marketing research helps improve decision-making, trace problems, and understand complicated relationships. Um, let's look at these steps, and then I want to go through an example. Um, it's important to remember that these steps are only as good as the data that you find. So um, if you have badly designed research or you're asking a question that's not actually answering what you're looking for, then you don't have great research. You may have a beautiful survey or you may go out and talk to people and do informal interviews. But if you're not asking the right questions and going about it in the right way, then you may not get to the root of your question or your problem. So first of all, you have to find what that problem is. And when we say problem in this context, we mean the problem in that, what is the question we're trying to answer? If you remember back to your science fair days as a kid, um, you had a hypothesis that was kind of where it's a very similar, like, hey, we need to know if people would want to buy this certain thing, or if we added a feature to our product, what would they think? So that's not necessarily a problem in a generic context, but in terms of research you have, you always have a problem or something you're trying to work. So number one, you identify that problem. If you don't do that correctly, then you're wasting your time as well. Um, Many times we do research to make sure we are identifying the problem or the opportunity correctly. And that is often written as a marketing objective after it's finalized. So if you remember back to our strategic plans, our marketing plans, and you had goals and objectives, a lot of times people will say, we want to now, now that we've found some information through marketing research, we're gonna use that information to drive our marketing tactics. So let's use the example of, um, 
taking, adding food, but I'll, I'll use an example. There's a bakery here in town and they make beautiful custom cakes and they make cupcakes and cookies. It's called Blue Horse Bakery. It's downtown. She's actually one of my clients, but I've used her as an example in my classes long before I had clients and long before I was managing her social media pages. But she, when she bought her building, she had um, purchased it from the former mayor of Nacogdoches who owned a place called Shelley's. Her name was Shelley. And it was this beautiful little tea room and they, all the ladies like to go there and have salad and quiche and things like that for lunch. Well, when she bought the building, people thought, oh, she's going to be a baker, but also could she do tea, like a tea room type menu? And she thought, well, the community supports Shelly's and Shelly's was going out, out of business because she wanted to run for mayor, not because they didn't like it or it wasn't good. And so she thought she saw a market opportunity there. Well, people wanted Shelly's. And so... What happened was they came to support Blue Horse Bakery and they really wanted Shelly's in a lot of in a lot of senses. And so Blue Horse Bakery had to change their business plan and they had to find a new way of going about it. They weren't doing anything wrong. The food was great. Everything was great. It just wasn't what the customers were expecting or they were probably had something in their mind because they really just wanted Shelly's and they weren't getting that. And so it just was never going to be good enough because that's how customers are, but the product, the actual product, the price, the place of being downtown, all of those things were good in terms of what Blue Horse Bakery was doing. So let's go through these steps and I'll just do this now of explaining to you how all these steps work using that example. So let's say today, Whitney decides I'm going to do more food. I want to do serve a lunch. I'm going to do sandwiches for lunch. So I'm going to identify and formulate the problem. The problem is, do people want sandwiches for lunch? Now we're going to design and plan the research. This is also where you can gather secondary data. Secondary data is information that's been gathered by somebody else. So um, databases, different places on the internet, news articles, um, anything that has um, like the census or um, the Pew Research Center. If you've ever looked at PEW, Pew Research, they have lots of information on just how data looks and what it feels like and how it's, I'll show it to you actually, because it's really cool. Um, they do lots of just data on human behavior. And so they look at um, before COVID-19, they look at how pastors discuss the election. They have different um, topics on family and relationships. Um, you know, how do different demographics measure people in same-sex marriage? How, in their own words, America describes struggles and silver linings of COVID-19. They look at social media and like new habits. I always like to look at this. So Facebook posts early in the days of the Biden administration reflected ideological divide. And so they show all of this information. This is really, really great secondary data because this is an unbiased source for um, information. They even go into a lot of these studies, the really big ones, and they tell you how they did it so that you can look at their methods. You can look at the questions they ask. They're very, very transparent about that. And so that would be a great example of secondary data that you would gather. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But then you have to go in and decide how you're going to sample your your uh, who you're going to ask questions to. So if you think about a sample, that is kind of like a taste of a cupcake, right? You just take a little bite. That's a sample. That means you have this big group of people that you want to ask a question to, to help identify and formulate the problem, right? And you want to plan your research. And now we're going to sample and you're saying, okay, I'm going to take a grouping of these people. And there's lots of different ways to sample, which you can read about in your book. Um, but you can take a grouping of these people and say, hey, here's the question I'm trying to ask. And you're hopeful that that's representative of a larger population. A census is the opposite, or I guess adjacent to a sample, which is you talk to every single person in your group. So if I was going to take a census of our class and ask them what they thought about this lecture, I would talk to each person. If I was going to take a sample, I would talk to somebody who was representative or a couple people who are representative of the class. So as you can imagine, there are good and bad ways to go about doing that. You can really mess up sampling the wrong group of people because that wouldn't get you the answer to your question. But that is the third step. The fourth step is actually collecting the data. So is that an online survey? Is that you standing out in front of the student center asking people who walk into SFA's buildings if they would eat lunch at Blue Horse Bakery. 
that is um, sending out, for, fill, having them fill out surveys in front of you. It can mean any number of things. Um, there's lots and lots of different ways to collect data. And then you have to analyze the data. So there's a whole class on how to just analyze data. Statistics in itself is data anal analysis and how do we look at um, data analysis and how do we look at the information we collected and see if it answered our question. And then you have to prepare and present this as the report. So after you do that, what does the data look like? How do we interpret it? And then follow up. Remember I said that that follow up process is important because you have to be able to sit down and say, hey, I've got um, all this great information. Now, what are we gonna do with it? So you can read through these step-by-step. Step. I gave you an overview. Um, this is very self-explanatory. It's pretty direct. Your book does a really, really, really good job of explaining all of these things. This lists some secondary data for you. Um, this also, talks about the advantages and the disadvantages of primary and secondary data. So let's talk about that. This will be on your test. So I want to make sure we cover this a little bit. Um, advantages of secondary data. It saves you time and money like this Pew Research Center. Remember, they've already done the work, so we wouldn't have to do it. It helps in formulating the problem statement, which is that first step. So it can help you decide okay, based on previous data, this was the trend, and now I'm gonna jump in and ask new information, but it's helping me as kind of a platform to building a new research study. It also helps find research methods and helps with data, and it can pinpoint the type of people that you should approach in answering a question. And it also serves as a basis for other data. So let's say they did a survey on something, and then we go out and did a survey. Example, um, let's say Pew Research Center did a, a survey mm -hmm. on who likes to eat out at lunch during the week? Well, Whitney could use that to inform herself. Blue Horse Bakery could use that to inform their survey data as they go out to try to get primary information, which is information that comes directly from the people that we are collecting ourselves. Disadvantages, it's broader, right? So this Pew Research Center, they may have surveyed the entire state of Texas or all of the United States. And so that may not be specific to Nacogdoches where she has her business. And then it may not always give detailed information. So a lot of times these larger informations, you may read an article online about how millennials eat out more often and they don't cook as much at home. And so that's driving your thought process, but it's not gonna be super detailed and super specific to what you need. So um, you can look, I think this is a really, really great thing to review and take a little time to look at before you jump into your exam is, all these different types of data collection and how they all work with one another. And so take a little minute to look at that. Um, I don't think that this is super important. This is kind of, um, oh, you know, we do need to talk about this. Okay. Um, Open-ended, closed-ended, and scaled response questions. So these three columns, you'll need to know the difference between these. Open-ended is, hi, Tell me about your day. And it's open, right? It's open for you to answer however you want. Close ended. Hi, did you have a good day? Yes or no? You can see examples that can happen in a yes or no format, an agree or disagree format, or a multiple choice format. It's closed off, that's the end. And then scaled responses. On a scale of one to 10, how was your day? It was definitely good, it was definitely bad, it was okay, it was amazing, it was the best day I've ever had on a scale of one to five. So um, this is also known as a Likert scale because the guy who invented it, his name was Likert. So that's pretty geeky. Um, but kind of know about these, there are advantages and disadvantages to all of these types of questions. Because if you ask too many open-ended questions, you get lots of varied answers. You get lots and lots of information. You can't recognize trends, right? Um, if you get closed-ended questions, too many closed-ended questions, you don't maybe get really good information about specific situations or you don't get really rich data. And so you kind of need a mix of all of these to help inform most survey data. So um, other ways that marketing research can take place, you can do mystery shoppers, you can do experiments where you observe. Um, and then let's talk about sampling a little bit. I want you to dig in in your textbook about sampling. It's a lot easier to kind of read about the differences and kind of walk through it in your text and in your um, mind tap units and stuff because um, 
sampling can get kind of complicated. Um, but just think about probability sampling here versus non-probability sampling. So that's the key here to kind of think about. And then you can read about the different types of sampling within those, but these are kind of the two big categories. So probability sampling means every single person has the same likelihood of being selected, whereas non-probability means there is not an attempt made to find a cross section of the population. So let's say Whitney used a convenience sample where she asked every person who entered her store how they would feel about sandwiches at lunchtime. Well, guess what? That is not giving every single person in Nacogdoches that could buy her product a chance to answer because those are only the people who frequent her shop, who already do business with her, who know about her. That is really, really great. It's not necessarily bad, but um, it doesn't give you this larger picture. So that data may be a little bit skewed because she's only asking people who already support her. Whereas probability sampling would be if we went out and we numbered everybody in Nacogdoches from one to 60,000, and then we did a random number generator and picked people based on those numbers. And that means everybody got to pick themselves. Everybody had the same chance of getting chosen. And that would be a random sample. There's lots and lots of different ways to randomly sample um, people. And you can read all about those. But those are the two big things that your, your exam will question you over. There will be some questions about sampling in general and the different types of sampling. But make sure you know non-probability versus probability. So um, like I said, these last two um, steps are important, preparing and presenting the report, and then actually what you're going to do with this information. What is the point of having the info if you don't do it, if you don't use it? Um, and then finally, I don't think that you need to get super bogged down in all of these different types of surveys here. You can read, like I said, I'm going to show you that, that um, chart again read this and kind of know this more than internet-based surveys and scan-based surveys and things like that. That's really interesting stuff, but um, most of you are kind of getting your feet wet and learning about survey data in general. And I think that this is an easier place to start than down here. So I hope that that helps shed some light on this unit and I hope that you enjoy listening to me ramble on. So thanks for tuning in.